two general issues must be kept in mind in assessing the living and The conditions must be assessed in their historical and geographical context. It's unreasonable to compare conditions in an underdeveloped, war-torn country in the 1970s to conditions in peacetime, modern, The closing order's allegation that the CPK created, and I quote, conditions that were calculated to bring about the destruction, quote, of the population, that is a major, major misinterpretation. The CPK did not intentionally withhold material from the people or deny the people better conditions. The situation was difficult because there simply was not enough material or better conditions to offer. For example, the co-prosecutors argue that people at the work sites were not provided with mosquito nets or blankets, and what they suggest is that the CPK denied them such support. However, The truth is, as is evidenced by numerous CPK documents, that the party was trying its best to produce as much clothes, mosquito nets and blankets as possible to meet the people's needs. The reality is, it takes time to obtain enough supplies for an entire population. So in the meantime, people were asked to bring whatever they had at home to the work sites. Some people had mosquito nets and blankets. Some did not. The situation varied. But the CPK had no policy to deny people supplies. And even nowadays, many Cambodians in remote areas Still don't have And the same goes for the alleged lack of proper toilets at the work site, the shortage of medicine, and the inability to eliminate malaria and malnutrition. And then the second issue is the autonomy of low-level authorities. As I mentioned earlier, Unit authorities have large autonomy regarding the daily organization of work, and this resulted in the variation of conditions. As I said, some units implemented the party policies correctly, while others deviated from the policies. And I'll give you an example here. Each village was responsible for the food supply for its members at the work site. As a result, While some claimed about the complained about food shortages, people from other locations said that they had enough rice and fish to eat. To take another example, the setting of individual work quotas varied substantially between different units. Some people reported that they had to carry one cubic meter of food per day. Others claimed that they were assigned more, ranging from 1.5 to 6 cubic meters. And it was also up to the unit authorities to allow people to rest when necessary. Again, Similarly, Mr. President, While some claimed that their units worked frequently at night, others said that night work was exceptional. Sometimes it owed to the specifically urgent nature of the task, or sometimes it was just because it was easier to work during the cooler hours at night time. However, CPK senior leaders should not be held criminally responsible for practices that deviated from the CPK's explicit policy or from its fundamental principle to care for the people to whom their support. And as to the allegation that the CPK forced children to work as adults, it is a deviation from the CPK's official policy to do so. 
การทำแบบนี้ประจักษ์ที่โกลยมายเราบอกปะกรมบริการบุญเชียร์ให้ให้กระแสเนี่ยเราบอกปะกรมบริการบุญเชียร์บานบุญเชียร์ยาสบาธาเอาเกาะมาทุกการเงียบสราสราแต่ปัจจุบันนกในพิจารณาผมเรียนพ่อตาชบล็อกปีบัญชีปีมูลเฮดเดลยูยูมดองเป็นการประจักษ์โคลยูไบเบนิตีตัวจริงจังอะไรแบบดังรถปัจจุบันนี้บันปรับอองตุนเดียร์ก็โนตตุตุจังทุกการโนตตุนุบุยเมตตาตัวไปที่ปรับก็มันเอาตัวทุกการตินุบุยสักก็โนกไม่ก็ดังก็บันยี Thus, preferred construction work to farming. Turning to the allegations, people had no freedom. It is very important to remember that this freedom is not absolute. International law allows certain restrictions of it. It's normal and it's legitimate that people need to seek permission to leave the designated working location during working hours. Even we have to. However, the evidence shows that outside working hours, on the official records, that is on the official records, that is on the official records, that is on the official records. And in any case, lawful restriction of freedom of movement is normally restricted for the military, especially if they are on secret missions such as building the secret Kampong Chinang airfield. Moreover, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, given that military desertion and absence without leave are both illegal in any country. It's legitimate that soldiers who deserted their duty at the airfield would ultimately be captured and interrogated. Turning to another point that the co-prosecutors raised in their brief and in court, the evidence shows that patrolling guards at the work sites were not there to control the people, but to provide security for them, such as by preventing them from approaching dangerous areas to avoid accidents. They also had duties to protect the construction from external menaces, such as sabotage by rebel movements. Additionally, the evidence shows no systematic discrimination against so-called new people or any other group of people. Nor is there evidence of large-scale condition rating death. Actually, most witnesses testified that there was no death of overwork or starvation, and in many units there were no deaths at all, even from diseases. And the co-prosecutors have also failed to prove any causal link between any alleged death and the working or working condition. Mr. President, this takes me to my fourth and final thing, which is security issues. Within this theme, I'll talk about three topics. Alleged punishment measures, so-called enforced disappearances, and killings. First, as to punishment. Some people claimed that in their units, food rations were reduced for those who failed to fulfill their work quota. Others say that their units did not have such a practice. What's clear, therefore, is that the food reduction practice deviated from the CPT policy. And in fact, the Southwest Zone Secretary, Tamok, explicitly instructed his subordinates that there should be no consequence for failing to meet the work quota. Likewise, Pol Pot also said that the rapid development of the country must not be done at the cost of the people's health. Turning to the allegation that lazy people will put in so-called special units to be punished by working harder and eating less. What the evidence actually shows is that witnesses who claim that this happened were actually never part of those special units. They only heard about it. It also appears that many of them assumed that these special units were a punishment measure because their members had to work harder. 
ตอนนั้นมวยโดยสารสมาชิกក្នុងกองเต็งนุ่มเราบ้านเปิดการตรวจสอบ As to the second issue, alleged disappearances, there is no credible evidence that any of those amounted to an illegal deprivation of liberty involving DK officials, and nor is there evidence that the officials intentionally hid their fate or whereabouts of the people. Now, you will recall this from the hearings. Some witnesses or civil parties claimed that people disappeared after being called to study sessions or being reassigned to other tasks in other locations or being hospitalised. But there is actually no evidence that these official reasons for their absence were untrue. And it's actually worth me highlighting that the evidence does show that there were indeed occasional trainings frequent vacation or transfer of workforces and hospitalisation of ill or injured people. And in addition, some soldiers were absent from work because they illegally deserted their country's posts. Finally, as the Supreme Court chamber ruled, enforced disappearances even if proven, is insufficient for finding that killings occurred. And so regarding that question of killings, let's discuss that a little bit more. Mr. President, there is neither forensic evidence nor credible witness evidence to prove any alleged killings beyond reasonable doubt. Again, let's take Kampong Chinang Airfield, for example. One witness speculated that there was a place about 500 meters away from the airport, which was a killing site. And he said that simply because soldiers were prohibited from going out. But in fact, the tribunal's investigators um, side identification report clearly states that there was no sign of mass graves in the area surrounding the airfield. The closest mass graves they could find were about 20 kilometers away. And this was said to be the location where some East Zone soldiers were allegedly killed and buried after the 6th of January 1979. However, I don't need to tell you this. Events subsequent to the 6th of January 1979 are outside the jurisdiction of this tribunal. And just to finish off this point, it's also worth us noting that the co-prosecutors blatantly misrepresented the site identification report in this regard in paragraph 1202 of their brief. To conclude on the evidence on cooperatives and work sites in the DK and on this part of Noon Chia's case in general, Mr. President, the co-prosecutors have failed to prove beyond reasonable doubt that any of the alleged crimes in relation to any of the four sites took place, nor have they managed to establish Noon Chia's criminal responsibility for those crimes. As with what we said during our discussion on cooperatives, ประเด็นสำหรับเรื่องเล่าหนุนน้องเฟลเดียมพิสัยก่อนการถ่ายเมื่อเช้าเมื่อเช้าเมื่อเช้าเมื่อเช้าเมื่อเช้าเมื่อ